That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and he told them many things in parables, saying, In a certain city, there was a judge who neither went up to feared the God to nor pray. respected man. One man was going there, there, there was a man who had Jericho. two sons, and, he was and the younger there of them said to his father, there was a rich man who was clothed in shining and shirt, and, and, and he feasted sumptuously every night, and at his feet was laid a woman who was clothed in shirt. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure. stories he told. Again, he, that is Jesus, began to teach beside the lake. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the lake and sat there, while the whole crowd was beside the lake on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables, and in his teaching, he said to them, listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell on good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear Listen. When he was alone, those who were around him and the twelve asked him about the parables. And this is what he said. The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root and endure only for a while. And then, when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. Well, we're three weeks into this, and so far it's not a very good report, is it? (laughs) Week number one was this hardened path or a hardened heart, which the life-giving word seed literally bounces off as it's dropped upon it and it's swept away. And we said a few weeks ago that everybody here has a hardened path running somewhere through his or her heart, some area of life that's resistant to the seed that God wants to plant there. And two weeks ago, we invited God into our sin and into our pain and into maybe the sinful responses to our pain, which are typically the 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 sources for our resistant hardness. And we invited God into those places to break up and recondition that hardened ground. Week number two, last week, was rocky ground, shallow ground, that is, with this impenetrable bedrock just below the surface. The seed goes in, germinates, and sprouts, but it has no protective depth, no depth, no no nourishing root. And so pressure comes, the plant, that is, the person withers and falls away. We need this constant watering with many, many words from God, a steady drip system of hearing and reading, engaging with the word that he speaks to us to break up that bedrock and to take us deep, to root us securely and prepare us for whatever hardship comes. Today, 
it's soil number three. That is heart number three, and it's all about choking thorns in our lives. Our hearts, if we're honest, are to one degree or another just a mix of the word that God is planting in us and then unfriendly thorns we water and we feed and we nurture, growing up and competing with choking out the life-giving word. I'm talking about a weedy portion of ground in the soil of your heart and my heart that, that struggles to yield any kind of fruit. Everybody's got that. And Jesus names the thorns this morning in the story, in this portion of the story. Here they are, the cares of the world, the lure of wealth, the desire for other things. Ben Sternke is an Anglican priest. He summarizes them this way, worry, wealth, and wanting. And Jesus starts with worry for a good reason, because the lure of wealth and the desire for other things, well, they feed upon and are fueled by worry. And again, as Jesus names worry, that is the cares of the world. Perhaps that'd be better translated as the anxiety of the world, the anxiety of the world that is in every one of us. One writer put it this way, it's the special general nervousness about life and the craving to master life that then monopolizes the heart's concerns. That kind of uncertainty, that fear that we carry around with us. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen in the future? What's going to happen tomorrow? What do you think is going to happen? What if we're not prepared with what might happen, even though we don't really know what's going to happen? Wringing our hands, devoting a lot of think time to that, getting the best of our waking moments, our intelligence, our imagination, and our love, and inflicting other people with our nervousness. Anybody do that ever? Your heart being monopolized by all of the what-ifs. How are we going to make it? Where am I going to end up? When am I going to get hired? When am I going to get married? Will the check arrive? Will I pass the test? Will I make it into the right school? Will I make the right decision? Will I stand up for what is right or cave in? Will I stand up when the bully comes at me and he or she intimidates me? What's going to happen to Glenn Kirk in the future? Who will the next pastor be? And what's going to happen then? Worry. Jesus says, that's a patch of thorns. To use another image, the Christian life can be described as constantly moving out of the driver's seat and letting Jesus take the wheel. Worry can be described as saying over and over again, thanks a bunch, Jesus, for driving, but are you aware of all this traffic and what might happen to us? I think I'd better take the wheel now for a little while. That's worry. Sin is grabbing it. As opposed to releasing that wheel, releasing the, the worry, and all that we're choosing to bear, letting go of the worry burden, resigning as general manager of the universe, you know, you've heard that. And in faith, affirming once again, well, what's it say over there? God can be trusted. Paying attention to Jesus' words in other places. He talks about worry a lot, but remember the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, he says, do not worry. That would be a command. Saying, here's what worry looks like. What will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles. That's kind of the catch-all category for those who don't know God, don't have God to turn to, so they've got to manage their anxiety on their own, thus with those kinds of questions. For it is the Gentiles who strive for all of these things, that is, they worry about these things and act out accordingly, and it's not pretty. And Jesus says, and indeed, your Father knows that you need all these things. Listen, you've got a Father who's really powerful, and He's good, and He loves you, and He knows you need them. What do fathers who are good and able and love you do? They provide for you. So Jesus says, but, that is, instead of worrying, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is, 
Give your think time to that and act out accordingly to that. And then all these things, that is all the other things you could be spending your time obsessing about, will be given to you as well. God can be trusted. You know, we have six members of our senior staff team here at Glenkirk, Pastor Betsy, Paul Bublin, our facilities director, Eric, our worship leader, Dusty, our student ministry director, Kim Burdett, our guest manager, and me. And we meet once a week, spend time together, and we are walking through our big picture whys, our big picture we believes together. We're just taking one a week. Eric asked us to share a story the other day of how God can be trusted. That is, how have you found God to be trustworthy in your life? It was really interesting just listening to everybody. You learn about people, get to know them as they share things like that. And I just talked about my own, let's just call it my own employment history, my, my, my employment story. And this is my story. It's not everybody's story. I mean, we're, we have a job search class for a reason. This is not everybody's story. I may need to be taking it soon. You never know. <laughs> but I've really never been somebody who had a lot of options to choose from at any one time. You know, gosh, which job will I pick? That's just not been my story. What I have found is that there's always been an open door when it was time for one. When one ministry assignment came to an end and I was in need of another ministry assignment, something's always come up. And at times, just out of the blue, often not what I would have ever predicted or planned. For example, winding up on the staff of my home church, Trinity Santa Ana, one of our sister eco-churches, very much like Glen Kirk, same size. When I was 29 years old, I was running out of money as a graduate student. Anybody ever been there? Living in Claremont. And I was just thinking, what am I going to do? Three months later, I was on the staff of my home church. My first pastorate when I was the tender age of 36. I mean, it was just perfect for what God wanted to do in me and through me. It was close to where my mother lived and my brother and his family up in the Santa Barbara Ventura area going to work for our eco family on the national staff in, in 2015, coming here at the end of 2016, and then here's one, seeing one door close after another in the early 2000s, and I was just asking God, what, what are you up to? I knew I was supposed to be leaving this 11-year this pastorate in Port Wainimi up in the Ventura area, but I didn't know where I was to be going. And then this door started opening wide to live and minister in the country of Turkey, which I did for eight years. Never saw that one coming. And, and I'm not saying that these doors were just easy to kind of waltz through. I mean, each one required a step of faith, walking into the unknown, at times with some fear and trepidation, each one with its own share of difficulties. That's right, we do say over there that life is a daring adventure. We believe that. And what we're also saying, what I'm saying by telling you this story is that God can be trusted. Remembering your own story of God being faithful, God being trustworthy is one of the best ways to tear out all the thorn bushes that are currently choking your life with worry. Biblical Israel's great chronic failing, which often got her into trouble, was that she typically forgot her own story. And then she would worry, and then she'd fall into all kinds of ridiculously stupid things. Christian worship is essentially remembering the story every Sunday morning. The table recites the story Well, I've done my sharing through the years, my, sh my share of worrying through the years. I don't know about you. Here's how Pastor Sternke again describes that. Stewing internally about things, mapping out scenarios and creating contingency plans and trying to foresee every eventuality. <laughs> Isn't that great? But in the end, it doesn't actually help us. 
He says, the disasters that we try to anticipate rarely occur and we're rarely prepared for the bad things that actually do happen to us. Worry never did advance the ball down the field one inch for me. And it has wasted a lot of my time. The cares, the anxiety of the world, that special general nervousness about life and the cra craving to master life's things that get on you, that just monopolize your heart. What a waste of time. What a thorn sowing, seed word of God, choking, colossal waste of time. Thorny weed killer for worrying is remember your story. I try not to give too much ground to those worry thorns in my patch of soil anymore. But I have to confess that what I do give ground to more than I would wish is the next one on Jesus' list, and that is the lure of wealth. The lure of wealth. Again, here's a better translation, the lie, the deception of wealth. The illusion that money's going to make the cares of the world, the anxiety of the world, go away. Financial security. That's actually an oxymoron. There is no such thing. Oh, I'm going to put my efforts here and, and put my trust here and I'm going to sleep well at night. Anybody here have money invested in a house or in the stock market in 2008, 2009? I did. I don't think I have to say anything more. <laughs> Ernst Lohmeyer, interesting guy, he was a, an officer in the German army in World War II. He had been a New Testament professor in a German university before, fought with distinction. He came home, he was not a Nazi. And he came home to become the rector of a university in the eastern part of Germany, which the Soviets controlled, and he was somebody to speak his own mind, and they arrested him in 1946. He disappeared. Nobody ever saw him again. They found out that he was killed. This is what he says as he comments about this. He says, we are not told here that wealth can deceive, but that wealth is in itself deceit. The lure of wealth, this is how he translates it. The deceitfulness that is riches. And the idea that cash in the bank will make you happy, that growing your money as an end in itself will fulfill you, that is, fill you full, let alone preserve and protect you. Well, there is that memorial service question answer back and forth regarding the deceased. Have you heard it? It goes like this. Question, how much did he leave behind? Answer, every bit of it. <laughs> you really want to devote the best of your waking moments, the best of your energy, intelligence, imagination, and love to amassing wealth, when in the end it delivers so little? And if Jesus is to be, to be believed, <laughs> if Jesus is to be believed, you want to devote yourself to money like that, which actually works against what God is trying to do, what he's trying to sow and cultivate in your heart, which then delivers so much. That's what the parable is about. Wait till next week. Here's another one from Jesus and you all know this, it is, it really is more blessed to give than to receive. Related to that is this one, it is more blessed and a lot more fun and yields eternal dividends to share the wealth than it is to amass it and sit on it. Jesus said this, give, and it will be given to you. That's really kind of a surprise. We think if we give, it won't be given to us. That's why we want to keep it and not give it. But this is a law of the kingdom of God. Given, it will be given to you. And now he goes to the marketplace and he uses an image 
of somebody with a container getting some grain or getting some nuts or whatever you're buying there. Here's how it's going to be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together. You know how you shake things together to get it down a little bit more? You can put more in it. Shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. That is, you're sitting down. Somebody's going to just lay it right in there. That's how God gives when you give. And, and here it is. He says, here's why I say this, because for the measure that you give will be the measure that you give back. You get back, sorry. Most of us here have yet to come to terms with every phrase in that surprising authoritative teaching. Thorny weed killer for worry, remember your story. Thorny weed killer for wealth, giving. Now there's one final thorn that chokes the word seed God is planting in you and you heard it, yeah, it's the desire for other things. Anything in competition with and counter to Jesus Christ and what he wants to sow into you. Now, the desire for other things, other things can include a relationship that's become dominant in your life. The thing that you just most want. Or my over-the-top agenda for my children. Give them a break. Or my striving for recognition and affirmation. Or all the stuff money can buy, which is probably where this is going the most. Anything really that's out of order, that is not first submitted to and controlled by Jesus as Lord. Other things. Drawing away your energy, intelligence, imagination, and love from him. Desire for something rivaling your desire for him. Listen, your passion for things is good and blessed as long as it's under the lordship of Jesus Christ. But I remember a friend of my brother who was a musician in high school. And my brother is a really good guitarist, and they would play guitar together. And this friend of his, Jim, said, you know, if I didn't have my music, I really don't know what I'd do. That nothing's more important to me than my music. And another friend said, privately, he said, that's really dangerous. Other things. Here's an example. I don't know that it's really the best example, but I just wanted to share this with you. I had a really nice acoustic guitar. And I just sold it to Adam Savala. He's one of our high school students. He's up here on the left on a regular basis, leading. Eric's been mentoring him. I sold it to him, but I went through kind of a struggle before I did. I gave him a good price. <laughs> I led worship and worship teams with that guitar of mine in the past. That really wasn't my favorite thing to do, but it's part of what I did, what I felt called to do. I stopped doing that in 2004 when I headed off to Turkey. I left the guitar in storage and really haven't touched the guitar in 14 years. No real desire to play it. I mean, it's just not kind of in me, you know? And I had been thinking, what am I keeping it for? But it was a nice guitar. I mean, it was beautiful. It is. You'll see it up here one of these weeks. I was thinking, you know, maybe someday I'm going to need it. Better hold on to my beautiful, nice guitar. I liked having it. And then there's Adam, you know, who's this young guy who's got a passion for playing and for leading worship. He wants to learn that. He's doing that with our youth group. He's part of the team up front here. He's hungry. He's learning. He's growing as a musician, ready for a better instrument to up his game. So we talked about my guitar, and he was getting all excited about the possibility, and I'm thinking, do I really want to let go of this guitar of mine? Yes, okay, Jesus is nudging me. So I bring it to church, and I show it to Eric, our worship leader. Eric looks at it, plays it, he says, gosh, this is a really nice guitar. Are you sure you want to let go of this thing? <laughs> Thanks, Eric. So I went home, 
And it just occurred to me, I mean, the Holy Spirit showed me. I didn't actually own that guitar. There was something about the guitar that was owning me. Someday I might want it. Better hold on to it. Beautiful, nice guitar. You know, I felt so free, and it was so much fun, after yanking that thorn bush out of my soul to put that guitar in Jesus' hands and into Adam's hands. Here's a good rule of life that a friend of mine shared with me about a week and a half ago, and it will pull a lot of thorn bushes out of the soul of your heart if you act on it. Here it is. If you're not using it, it already belongs to somebody else. I mean, it belongs to Jesus Christ, whatever it is, but he has somebody else's name on it if you're not using it. I have other things that I want to get rid of. After my assignment at Glenkirk is done, I'm going to spend some time cleaning house. I've decided that. Uprooting a number of thorny bushes that I am identifying in my own life. The desire for other things. Thorny weed killer for worry, remembering your story. Thorny weed killer for wealth, giving. Thorny weed killer for wanting, the desire for other things. Garage sale. <laughs> hey. I know I'm not alone. <laughs> or maybe I should say rummage sale in the spring, right? Let me pray for us. Father, we come to you through the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. You are so busy in this place. We want to have good soil. We don't want to have a hardened path. We don't want to have a rocky soil that is resistant to depth and root growth. And we don't want to have soil with thorns in it that compete, that grow up and choke the word seed that you're sowing in us. We don't want to have the cares of the world dominate and monopolize our hearts. We don't want to have the lure that, of wealth, that is the, the deceit that is riches, dominate us, and we don't want to have the desire for other things which just don't deliver. We don't want to have those things. So weed our garden, Lord, just cleanse it. Use the supper, use the table right now to just do your gardening work in our hearts. And we pray this in the name of the crucified and risen one. Amen.